My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Little bit of business before we get into talking about this giant phone book of comics. Jim, what you got going on? Octobriana, 1976. My latest comics project, a blacklight comic printed with fluorescent ink, is now available wherever comics are sold. If you're interested in weird comics, unique printed matter, things that don't look like any other comics in your collection, you're going to want to add Octobriana, 1976 to that collection. And if you're curious about how you make a blacklight comic, you can find out in my process zine that you can get from jimrug.com. Pick up Octobriana 1976 wherever comics are sold, preferably at your local comic shop. Give them some love, but you can get this online. You can get it again wherever comics are sold. Jim, I ask you, are you going to be reprinting this Blacklight comic? No, I am not. So good point, Ed. Uh, this is selling well. If you want one of these, I would recommend get it sooner rather than later. I'm going to sell my 500 bucks in a couple months. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Uh, serializing my Red Room comic strips. I... Uh, at least two pages per week every Tuesday. New new strips come out. Uh, three bucks get you the archive, and they're printed up in a high enough resolution that uh, kayfabers are printing up uh, paper editions so that they don't have to, uh, you know, stare into the sun of the computer screen while they read their comics. And uh, getting close to the first complete story is going to be up there. This is for the early adopters because we are uh, going to be printing these on paper they're going to be available through the direct market and such uh more news on that to follow but uh one other piece of business that's sort of unique is that uh right now until september 15th uh you can uh bid for hip-hop family tree original artwork available th through sotheby's auction house in new york city uh the end date is September 15th, but right now online bidding is commencing, and uh, there are links in the description below. You could see what the lots are, and uh, you could, you know, place a bid. Maybe maybe uh, get your hands on some covers or or something from, uh, from the comic. The business at hand, Jim, is uh, Essential X-Men number two and you look at me quizzically why, why 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 are we talking about this comic and to me this is one of the great marvel essentials to have uh first off man were you were you a, a, a buyer of the essentials when they were coming out yes i have quite a few and it, it was amazing it really was. We, we, we should give that context because man when they started i bought all of them right because it would be like Jack Kirby, you know, 30 issues of Fantastic Four in order, you know, the Jack Kirby stuff that I'd never be able to afford. It was all these, like, significant runs, like the Essential X-Men, because I was not being able to buy the new X-Men comics, uh, certainly not all of them. So this was amazing whenever they, this format came out. 13 bucks. They were, they were trying to, like, manga was in the air, and they wanted to try to, to, to you know, do do as close to that kind of... Thing is possible. It's one of the great formats. Like we often, you know, bang the drum of how great the artist edition format is. These essentials, I would argue, were similar. Where it was like, yes, this was a way to be able to read a bunch of these classic comics, an affordable way to read them, get a big chunk, get your money's worth. Pretty interesting. Whoever got behind this, very smart move. Here's what's dope about this one, man. Uh, we're gonna be just scrolling through 500 pages of John Byrne, Terry Austin artwork in pretty crisp black and white. These these are printed from photostats, and there are times where you're going to see Indicia copy notes to the colorist and oh, shit wow. like that. Um, but relentless. The, look at the level of craft. Look at the work they're putting into this stuff. They never took a month off. That's incredible. 500 pages. Because, I mean, that's that's your... A-list team, when you think of X-Men and what built X-Men, it really is the John Byrne Claremont run. Right. Byrne started in, like, issue 108 or something. Uh, it, this this uh, volume starts at issue 120, but goes up to uh, issue 144. Uh, so they, they're out of the picture at 143, but this is, like, you know, introduction of Alpha Flight. This is the entire Dark Phoenix saga um 
with the Hellfire Club and, and, and all of that. Probably the high point uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, Days of Future Past. That's in here. <laughs> That's about it, man. Dark Phoenix and Days of Future Past. Wow. Introduction of Kitty Pride is in here. But this is the one where it's just like you throw up your hands and you know, like we were talking about on the um the Dave Lapham uh episode about stray bullets. Look at look at that. Yes. Um how I was curious about Dave Lapham as a person because it's like he clearly there's some graphomania there, but with the graphomaniac usually you have pretty antisocial personality, but Lapham was like so good at capturing character. Um, I think this speaks a little bit to probably like Burns reputation, being able to turn in, uh, you know, like reliable artwork like this uh, month in, month out. And even, you know, Terry Austin definitely doing, doing a lot of the, the work on this. But, but when Byrne leaves this, he's going to leave X-Men to do like, three monthly books right. so he's very comfortable let's say being his own company yeah and we should say this is where he becomes a superstar totally um, you know I, I you can find older burn work and it looks good and stuff but this is the thing that made john burn john burn this is like the first uh issue of classic x-men that i got off the stands man the one that, that has uh has has this story in here man Whenever you mention Terry Austin, who definitely deserves some of the credit for Lots kind of the, the smoothness, credit. the polish, the finish, things like these details that really make this A-level work, um, come to mind Jim Lee Scott Williams, you know, to, to, a, a decade later. Yeah, one of the great uh, artist-writer tandems. And I always talk about, like, there are very few great collaborations in in mainstream comics, and I do cite the Claremont, Byrne, Austin, or Zakowski, and Glennis Wine or Oliver, depending on depending on when she got married or right, not. Right. Um, I think that they're one of the great collaborations in comics, but it's a different kind of thing. It's not like a Miller Jansen kind of comic that they're making. This is pulp material that that uh, can be described. It, it, it can be described as pulp in like sort of the best sense of the word, you know. It is worlds apart from what Miller was doing, you know, as a genre too. But it has that energy, you know. When you describe it as those guys having this, uh, you know, great collaborative success, that that synergy is on display. Like it feels like these pages are crackling. Yeah, a lot of ideas. They're definitely getting a lot of story in to each issue, and there will be issues where you almost like scratch your head like what and they just launch you into something completely new get in get out onto the next thing yeah and i wonder about you know like you get these artists at the right time when they're young and hungry and really have that energy and style i think claremont talked a little bit about that when we spoke to him you know like he's worked with so many different artists you write for 15 years you're gonna get a bunch of fresh new artists coming through and i think that's something that he kind of recognized as almost an infusion of energy and some new ideas. You know, who does this artist like to draw? Or what are they good at drawing? Uh, you know, maybe we work in that direction. And I think that's what you're seeing here is this artist-writer team that they're they're clicking. They're probably getting tremendous feedback from, like, fans and things uh, where they're feeding off of that, too, of, like, yeah, let's do more Jean Grey. Let's do more Wolverine. You know, that has, a, that, that has an impact. Like, if you're seeing articles in the press about you, if you're winning awards... If you're selling your books in bigger and bigger numbers, all of those things have an impact. And I think you see it. You know, I think these guys are trying to top themselves. Seeing this volume is really interesting considering where comics are today. Like nobody's going to do 25 issues, all right. you know, and, and especially not of this caliber. Like whenever an A-list art writing team show up on a book, they're doing an arc. You know, they're doing a trade paperback's worth. It's very rare that you would get something like this today, if at all. Like, I'm not sure there's any examples of this anymore. And Jim, man, I can't, I can't be stressed enough. These these guys, they took no breaks. They took no breaks in between, man. The density of the pages almost hurts my eyes. Right. <laughs> you know, it's a far cry. It's a manga format with 500 newsprint pages. 
but the density of the pages, man, you are not reading these spreads in a second and a half. This is one of those incredible for for uh, shadowing pieces because that's Jason Wingard and the reflect like the shadow really awesome. is uh you know it's not quite the same and it'll turn out to be mastermind you know but so they sold it like yeah. way early i don't think we saw it anywhere earlier where he is that guy and that'll pay off much later i love this kind of stuff too where you see like a visual effect being done in the line work right you know you see this character's being hit with this energy burst and so it's it's expressed in the line it's not all rendered out like the other figures are on the hunt for young Kitty Pride. Some screen tones here, man. We have the gradation screen tone, but also that organic dot screen tone. For sure. One of my favorite screen tones that, that uh, Austin would use on Cyclops mm -hmm. would be just these parallel lines. But once again, Essential X-Men Volume 2, it has a complete Dark Phoenix saga. It Look at that, dude. That's the iconic. I think this might have been my first classic X-Men issue. Uh, either this one or the following issue, but like that was always, man, I loved Wolverine and that was the Wolverine, like the money shot. I bet they printed that thing in so many places, magazines, promos. It's it's on a damn video game. Yeah. It's like in digitized 8-bit format, you know? Yeah, I think this was it. I think this was my first one and it was just perfect if you're a Wolverine fan. Just making mincemeat of those, those little jobbers. I would be in awe when I would start to try to figure out how to draw comics and I would see like all the backgrounds and stuff it would just kill me like how are you doing this you know libraries and studies and different rooms like the trim of the room really hard to wrap my head around molding and stuff and and uh one of the things that burn would do this was a cool effect too and i think this was cr i would see criticism of this and i think it was like a deadline criticism of like oh no backgrounds white backgrounds but it was perfect man like for an astral plane kind of weird surreal space that that was a good effect yeah and, and whoever would complain about that after seeing page after page of this stuff go to hell you know man. you know those people though right like totally. it's, it's always going to be whatever i can find and there weren't a lot of a lot of weaknesses in this stuff right so this is wrapping up man the uh the dark phoenix stuff um then comes then comes freaking uh essentially x-men grand design in, in 17 pages <laughs> It's one of my favorite comics. Uh, this one right here. You know, directly after Dark Phoenix Elegy. But it's Byrne and Chris Claremont going through issue one to, you know, modern day uh, up to this point. Go back to the cover of this one. That's that uh, New Mutants 98 homage. Right. 98 or 99, one of them, whenever Sunspot's, Sunspot's walking yep. away. <laughs> yep. And the, here they're sowing the seeds. Like this is in uh, this is verbatim the dialogue from uh, from X Men One, and I love it because of you know like Iceman as a homosexual character. And look, a redhead's come in. All of a sudden, blah blah blah. Uh, and then Iceman is leaving. He's a girl. Big deal. It's an issue one, man. But I, just to see Burn draw like all all the uh, villains and shit from from the history of X Men. This is worth the price of admission alone, man. See him draw the mimic? Super dope. And then, uh, you know, so it's Dark Phoenix Saga, then this elegy thing, and then it goes right into, uh, okay, a couple issues, and then Days of Future Past. But then it caps off with Brent Anderson doing... Uh, the despair man thing issue. It's the first time I ever saw man thing um, issue of uh, X-Men. And maybe auditioning for uh, God Loves, Man Kills. Yes. Anyhow, man, my favorite uh, Marvel Essential. Unbelievable to me in context, like thinking about... Wow. You know, this... <laughs> to, to just randomly flip a page. And, and, and I mean, it could, yeah. you could just do that. You could just do that, and you come to either an iconic sequence or, you know, money shots. Money shot after money shot. These guys firing on all cylinders, an essential volume worth having in the collection. Some of these essentials are uh, expensive books to, to track down, too. Usually the days. later ones, like, uh, you know, the very first essential was Spider-Man. Second, X-Men. Like, I remember, because I was buying all of yeah. those until it's like, 
I miss Marvel Essential. I don't think I need that one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the Spider Men are great too because of the Ditko stuff. Absolutely. And I mean, I guess they're great after that too. You know, Ramita rolls in and Gil Kane and stuff, so they continue being great. But yeah. but it, it, that was one of those I remember picking up and being so in love with it because. I didn't have a bunch of Ditko Spider-Mans. You know, I might have a couple of Marvel Tail, you know, reprint here or there that I would come across, but to be able to get a chunk of this stuff, you know, there's a lot of classics that this is, I bet this is how a lot of people got to read a lot of this classic material that we had heard about. You'd get an issue here or there, somehow maybe get lucky with one, but to be able to read them, you know, issue to issue like this. These, these babies, very rare at the time, were very faithfully reproduced from photo stats. There's a, there's, Another one that people people like to get their hands on that that is kind of expensive now, and it's it's the Conan one, Barry mm. Windsor Smith artwork. But they're the printing is ass. Uh, it's pixelated. Um, some of it's grayscale because they got some kind of weird. I always hate the grayscale stuff. And that's that's how uh, the the later X Men ones, volume yeah. nine through eleven. Uh, are the are the ones that are hard to find, more rare, just fewer of them out there. They started to phase this out because it was too good idea, and they wanted to, you know, chip away and sell tinier books in with bigger price tags. Um, DC follows suit shortly after Marvel introduces this format. DC starts reprinting stuff. One of their great ones is the Doom Patrol with that beautiful Bruno Pr- Primiani art where like the black and white you know some of this work looks just as good in black and white as it does in color too like right. not all art is suitable for this treatment but yeah. a lot of the uh the, the stuff maybe the 60s 70s when those guys were drawing in black and white uh it really looks great in this format and uh savage dragon has formats like this the savage dragon archives where larson's work is reproduced you know 25 30 issues at a clip some of those are expensive too so yeah it's a fun format also, Sergeant Rock, uh, or no, 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 uh, Hawkman by uh, Joe Kubert. Um, I don't think they did a Sergeant Rock, but if they did, I would definitely. This feels like the war comics would fit really well, especially with those like the short stories. You know, the the anthologies. Maybe the like the House of Mystery kind of stuff too. The horror stuff would probably be good. The the, the EC comics would be nice in this format. Whoever's out there listening. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't they want to chip away man they want to make a, a million dollars off of everybody you know anyhow man scoop this up i think these are in good enough quantity that you can get them for a cheap price uh but man you got to have it on 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 your bookshelf if you're if you're into superhero comics if you want to see a, a mainstream creative team at the height of their game um color does make the 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 whole experience go but like if you want to see that pristine artwork Right now, there's no better way. So that's it, K Fabers. Like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next videos are available. And we are on that race to 30,000 subs, man. So make that happen. Octobriana's in shops right now. Patreon.com slash Ed is where you can see the latest Red Room pages. Uh, every Tuesday, the Sotheby's auction for Hip Hop Family Tree artwork is live right now you could bid right now online and the little guy with the hammer is going to swing that thing and announce the final prices on september 15th subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the link below this video to keep up with all of this stuff that we're doing pick up cartoonist kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video <sighs> jimmy it's time to get back to business man we have comics to make today was a youtube day but we're cartoonists by day give them the marching orders read more comics